prisoner, and until I fully investigate this, I'm not handing her over to anybody. But by the way, she's starting to open up, so I think I'm going to get some information from her. The FBI rolled up the next day. We've all seen the American films, you know, FBI here, we've come to get our prisoner. Well, that's, they, they flew in by helicopter because nobody uh, would be crazy enough to drive down to Gasney apart from us. And um, they flew in by helicopter with more than a dozen armed soldiers and the police chief said that they rolled in to the cell where Afi was. There was a yellow dividing curtain. That's the only thing everybody agrees on, this yellow dividing curtain. And one of the soldiers went in and shot Afi. And it was as simple as that. What I do know and I, I'll stake my reputation on it, there can be no fingerprints on that gun that they say Afia removed from an American soldier and shot, um, and uh, fired uh, two shots. No fingerprints. We've all seen CSI. You can tell by the angles of the bullets. I'm sure the experts can, the ballistic experts can, will be able to tell uh, from our amazing camera work exactly who was where when the guns started firing. That, uh, that film and footage was offered to Afia's legal team, the one appointed by the government, the US government, and uh, they didn't take it up. They weren't interested. Can you believe that? The judge in New York, who is dealing with Afia's case, says he couldn't care less where she's been for the last six or seven years. He's not interested. All he's interested in is this two, three minute period of when the shooting started and now she faces the charge of attempted murder of an American soldier. Since the war on terror began, not one single suspect, not one single prisoner in Bagram, in Guantanamo, in any custody, during any arrest, not one single prisoner, and there have been thousands now, ever attempted or was ever in a position where he or she could get hold of an American gun. That was never, ever an option. And yet the Americans are now expecting us to believe that this tiny, frail little woman leapt out like some superhuman warrior and wrestled this rifle, uncocked it, and, and uh, discharged the weapon twice. It just doesn't stack up. Thankfully, the Pakistan government um, has paid $2 million towards a new defense team for Afia. It's totally unprecedented, and in a time when the Pakistan government rarely does anything that's worth um, saluting, I have to say this is a, a, an amazing um, gesture. They've paid for a new legal team. And the new legal team has been appointed, but the judge refuses to discharge the old one. The new legal team has to work under the supervision of the government-appointed legal team, which puts a big question already on the independence of the evidence. But I did contact them, and I had a meeting with one of them in Michigan a few months ago, and I said, I have this footage of interviews of people who were in the prison cell when Afi was shot. Do you want it? They said, you bet. They took that uh, footage, they've gone through it, and now the, def uh, the, the prosecution has asked for an adjournment. They 
Up until last week, the Chief Prosecutor couldn't say who he was going to call as a witness, as an eyewitness to the shooting of Afia. I mean, you wouldn't think it was rocket science. How many were in that cell when she was shot? And now he's saying, oh, uh, well, I don't know. One of the star witnesses, an American soldier, I'm not sure if he was the one who shot Afia or was uh, allegedly shot at, but one of their star witnesses has now been injured in the front line in Afghanistan. Why would you put your star witness in the line of fire? A star witness against the number one female Al-Qaeda operative. It just doesn't stack up. The Americans are in serious trouble over this case. Because that film and the raw footage that we gave them proves that they have lied and lied and lied right from the beginning of this whole case. When I did the documentary, I contacted the Pentagon again, and they still insist that prisoner 650 is not Afia Siddiqui. So I went up to Bagram. I tried to get into Bagram. There in, at Bagram are scores and scores of Afghan soldiers who are protecting the Americans inside. One American soldier came out and told me that the media people didn't want to talk to me. And so I left uh, Bagram um, without any comments or information. When I completed the documentary, I showed it to Binyam Mohammed. Binyam had just come out of Guantanamo. He had been arrested, rendition, tortured, long before Afia had disappeared. So he'd never heard of Afia Siddiqui when he was taken. And he was released earlier this year, a good six months after she had been shot and charged. And I asked him to watch the DVD and he said, I can tell you who Prisoner 650 is. And I said, who is it? And he said, Afia Siddiqui. I said, how can you be so sure? He said, because I saw her in Bagram. So I rang the Pentagon again and spoke to a Lieutenant Colonel Mark Wright and said, I've got another eyewitness. And this is irrefutable now. And it's come from a man called Binyam Mohammed, And he said, well, he's wrong. And I said, you know, Mark, I'm in a real dilemma here. Because who do I believe? Do I believe a man who has been tortured for seven years because he wouldn't lie? Or do I believe the government that brought us weapons of mass destruction in Iraq? It's a no-brainer, really, isn't it? And then he put the phone down. I don't think they're used to journalists speaking to them like that. Afia is still getting a bad media. She's called the Al-Qaeda mum by the, um, the tabloid media in America. And she has been criticised globally in the media because she refuses to go to court. The reason she refuses to go to court is because she has to be strip searched every time she leaves her cell to go to court. And then she has to be strip searched again when she returns to her cell. She doesn't cooperate with her legal team because every time she goes to see them, she has to be strip searched. And every time she finishes seeing them and goes back to her cell, she has to be strip searched again. Now I have seen CCTV footage of what it means to be strip searched in an American prison. And if you resist, as a female, you will be held down by four to five male prison officers, while two female prison officers will remove your clothes and then give you a full cavity search. 
This is nothing more than tantamount to rape. And she has to go through that when she leaves her cell and when she goes back into her cell. This is tantamount to rape. And when I discovered this bit, I went out to America a few weeks ago and I did a tour of um, six states, New York, Illinois, Alabama, Georgia, Wisconsin, Texas, all over the place. And I was telling mixed communities, not just Muslims, but largely Muslim communities, about what was happening, about what I called the rape of Dr. Afia Siddiqui. I wrote to the judge, I wrote to the governor of the institution, I came back um, and, and uh, urged cage prisoners to start a campaign. They uh, started uh, this postcard campaign with Afia's picture on, hands off, with a, a note to Judge Berman, making it personal, because this is personal. This is one of our sisters, and we have to get the message through to everyone. Mess with one of us, you mess with all of us. And this is a message to Judge Berman saying, hands off, Afia. The campaign is only a couple of weeks old. I've now got a letter from the Muslim uh, Legal Fund of America who have supported me in, in my... Uh, raising awareness on Afia's case in America. And they have just sent this yesterday saying, the legal team can now enter the prison and meet with Dr. Afia without her having to be strip searched. Make no mistake about it, this has come about because people like you have come to events like this, because people like you have signed cards like this. And there's an opportunity to do it again tonight. Um, Sister Mumtaz has set up a, a post office at the back, so you can buy a stamp, put it on the back of the card, sign it, and send this to Judge Berman. Because although the strip searching when she sees her legal team has stopped, they still carry on for any other visitors and for any other court appearances. I've spoken with Afia's brother. I've, I've met most of the family now. And Afia's brother tells me she's given up. She doesn't think she's going to get justice. She's been denied justice for six years, so why should things change now? That is her feeling. So once she's humiliated going through this strip search procedure and put in court, she has to listen to some of the, the rubbish that is, is uh, coming out. And in her last appearance, she stood up and she said, I'm not listening to this, I'm withdrawing from this court hearing, I want nothing more to do with it. And she got up and turned around and tried to walk away. And the court officials grabbed her and roughly manhandled her in front of the entire court and flung her back down into her chair. And when the case was over, again they manhandled her in a highly inappropriate way. In full view of the court, God knows what happens when those doors close and that sister's on her own again. We can only imagine. So it is vital we keep on sending these cards to Judge Berman. Make it personal. See that you post your card and... Um, and tell him and those filthy dogs that are holding her to keep their hands off Afia Siddiqui. She has suffered enough. It is crazy that having been rescued in one way in Afghanistan, she was put straight back into the hands of her accusers. It's unbelievable of, of her tormentors. And why would a Pakistani national who allegedly commits a crime in Afghanistan, be tried in New York. 
It doesn't make sense. The other sad thing that I...